a few events that are coming up. First of all, this evening at 5 p.m. in our chapel, we'll have a special presentation of the traditional Jewish Passover supper known as Seder. My good friend, Stuart Rothberg, who is a born again Christian, but grew up Jewish, will be sharing the detail of all of the meaning of the Passover elements. As Stuart concludes, we'll observe the Lord's Supper together as a church family as we enter Holy Week, Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday morning. That brings me to next Saturday morning, March 30th at 9.30 a.m. at the quarries. We will have our annual Easter egg hunt. The morning will be filled with lots of family-friendly activities, including bounce houses, refreshments, and of course, 12,000 eggs divided up into three different egg hunt groups, babies, preschoolers, and elementary kids. You'll not want to miss next Saturday morning at 9.30 out at the quarries for our Easter egg hunt. Then on Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Day, March 31st, we'll have two identical services at 9.30 and 11. I'm looking forward to that morning and the time we'll have to celebrate King Jesus and spend time worshiping and praising Him. Easter is a special time for families to come together and you'll want to take advantage of that morning to bring your family or invite your friends to attend one of our two services. As a congregation, I'm praying that many of you will choose to attend one service and serve in the other on our First Impressions team. For more information on how you can serve, contact Tyler Manning at tmanninghpbc.org this week to find out about those opportunities to serve. If you're a guest today, welcome. We have several ways you can connect with us here at Hyde Park. Please notice the QR code on the pew in front of you. Simply click on that code with your smartphone and it will take you to our website where you can click connect. If you'll fill out the information requested, one of our ministers will contact you and share with you how you can get plugged in to Hyde Park. Prayer is important to us and many of you may have prayer requests. If you would like to share that prayer request with us, we count it a privilege to pray for you in this coming week. You can submit your prayer request or praise through our website or by texting PRAYER to 512-812-9750. Your request will be confidential and prayed for during the week by our staff. All of the ministries at Hyde Park are made possible through your generous tithes and offerings. You can give through our app, our website, or in person by dropping your gift off at one of the offering boxes scattered around the worship center. In fact, your gifts were used just this past week by one of our mission teams as they traveled to Galveston. Here's Carlos Cameron to share with you about that trip and how God used your students on mission. Hello, Hyde Park family. We took a team of 23 to Galveston during spring break. Our team had 18 middle school and high school students and five adults. We worked with our missions partner, Galveston Urban Ministries, often referred to as GUM. Part of our work during the week was to serve other local organizations and churches in Galveston County. One team served the local food bank, another helped lay carpet and prepare to install trim in a church building. Another team went on to help remove bulk junk because their congregation was physically unable to. Our students jumped in and worked together in such a sacrificial way during the week. One of the highlights for our entire team was what Gum called street camp. We had the opportunity to gather children from the neighborhood and to engage them with the time of songs and Bible story. We got to share the story of Daniel in the lion's den, which was pretty exciting. We were able to engage both adults and children by, by providing food and activities during a block party one night. Our week was busy, but rewarding. It was rewarding to see how our team grew closer to one another and to God. I know it's been a long time since our church's student ministry has gone on a mission trip, and I pray that this is just the first of many. Thank you, Hyde Park, for your support of our students as we seek to go and live out God's word in his world. Thanks, Carlos. God is so good as he allows us to go in his name to minister his gospel to others. Next week, we'll hear about Hyde Park's mission team to India 
Dr. Tyler Manning and that team are going to share with you how they brought the gospel to some remote areas of Northern India. You will be equally excited to hear that report on next Sunday, that would be Easter Sunday morning, many lives that were changed for eternity. Thanks again for choosing to worship at Hyde Park today. It's my prayer that you will be encouraged and inspired through the worship and teaching from God's Word today. Well, good morning. Great to see you in God's house. What a great day it is to worship the Lord. If you are online, thank you for worshiping with us as we begin uh, this week, as we focus on uh, the Lord's resurrection next Sunday, Easter Sunday. So, the quick reminder I have for you, we have these invitation cards available again. Easter Sunday, invite somebody to come to Easter Sunday next week at 9.30 and 11 a.m. There's somebody in your sphere of influence. We all have spheres of influence. It's kind of cool to say. We all have our spheres of influence that you can invite to come to worship with you next Sunday. But we also have our Easter egg hunt on Saturday, 9.30 to 11.30 uh, a.m., uh, well, there'll be plenty of eggs and candy. We'll be sharing the gospel, just a great way to connect with family. So invite somebody to that. So as I've had a busy weekend, you may have as well. Let's take a breath and pray together as we begin to focus our minds on Jesus this morning. Heavenly Father, how gracious and wonderful, holy, mighty, powerful you are. Lord, we come together this morning to worship you and you alone. Lord, may our focus be you and you alone. May we realize your mighty works, the mighty gift of your salvation, and praise you with all of our hearts. Lord, bless the teaching of your word so that it connects to our lives as we try to live it out this week. It's your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together, go to the word of our God, and singing about our coming Messiah. Malachi 4, verse 1. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall, and you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing for you, says the Lord of hosts. Behold, I am coming to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amen, church. Let's put our hands together.
You may be seated, church, as we continue worship for the reading of God's Word. First Corinthians fifteen fifty four. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.
Revelation 5:11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living, creatures and elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea, and to all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four, li four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped.
love that came to our rescue. Despite our betrayal and our denial, we go the way to our sin. Facing death by being nailed to a cross. And while darkness appeared victorious, this love emerged from the grave. Morning, church family. Hope you are having a blessed Palm Sunday. So glad that you could be here to worship with us today. Those of you joining us online, we are so glad you could be here. Well, it is Palm Sunday, which means this is where we celebrate in this coming week, Christ's final week here on earth. And when we come back next Sunday morning, we are celebrating not his death, but what? His resurrection. His resurrection. You know, the, the video ended with John 15, 13. Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus spoke those words in his farewell discourse, the evening that he commemorated the Lord's Supper and instituted it for us. He spoke those words, but then the very next day he backed them up, didn't he? He gave his life for you and for me. What we're going to look at the next two weeks is, in fact, his greater love. We've called this series Greater Love, but his greater love. And we are going to look at what his greater love brought and still brings. And it is two things. It is both loss and gain. His greater love brings both loss and and gain. Now it's interesting to me, John's gospel has 21 chapters. The first 11 chapters, which is over half of the book, is spent retelling the first three years or the three years of Jesus' ministry. But then in chapter uh, 12, we pick up on Jesus' final week. It slows down significantly. The final 10 chapters have to do with Jesus' final week. In fact, in chapter 13, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, we see the washing of the disciples' feet. We see that last supper uh, that is there. We're in the final 24 hours of Jesus' life and then the few days that that take place after that and then we see Christ's resurrection so today is Palm Sunday so because of that we will be in John chapter 12 and we're not going to be in the verses that you think we're not going to start in verse 12 we're going to start in verse 20 today verse 12 through 19 shares the story of the triumphal entry you've heard many Palm Sunday stories and sermons on uh, that particular passage of scripture as you are familiar with that you know a large crowd greeted Jesus you'll remember from the synoptic gospels how the people would lay their cloaks on the ground and they had palm branches and they were waving those above Jesus as he walked by and they were shouting at him now remember I want you to think about this on Friday they are also shouting at him on that good Friday are they not what happens just five days before is them shouting for joy, Hosanna! Blessed is the he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Hosanna, that word means, oh, save. They are calling him the king of Israel. They see Jesus as the coming Messiah. And yet we find out that Jesus was riding in on a colt, on a donkey, rather than a white horse like a conquering king. You see, these people were all mixed up. They had the wrong Messiah. 
they had the wrong Messiah. And because of that, they will be shouting at Jesus that Good Friday, but they'll be shouting in anger, rage, and shouting for his death. So it is with that in mind that we do celebrate Palm Sunday. Jesus, by the way, riding in on that cult fulfills scripture about him. Zechariah 9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, which they did, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation in him, uh, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. He fulfilled that scripture, amen? amen? They had the wrong Messiah, though. Here's why in verse 10, the very next verse in Zechariah 9, it ends with this. He, the Messiah, shall speak peace to Jerusalem, right? To the nations, it says. They got it wrong. They thought that the Messiah would come for the nation state of Israel. That is not who he came for. He came to speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. When Jesus was resurrected and he gives the great commission, he says, make disciples of how many nations? All of them. By going and baptizing and teaching in that same vein in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 he tells the disciples to wait for him in Jerusalem until his Holy Spirit comes on them in power and then they will be his witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Uh oh, here we go. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10 to the ends of the earth the Messiah came for all people. Amen? He came for all people. They got it wrong on that Palm Sunday. Our verses are going to pick up just after that first Palm Sunday. That's Palm Sunday where Jesus rode in on the donkey, but I don't want you to feel like you didn't get your money's worth. So as you turn to John chapter 12 in verse 20, I'll tell you another Palm Sunday story. It's a little more recent though. See, there was a little girl who was home with a sore throat. Mom had to stay with her. It happened to be Palm Sunday. She's kind of sad, getting excited about Easter as, as kids do. As many little girls would do when they hear the car door shut and they uh, know that dad and the older siblings are coming home, she runs to greet them at the door and she asks her father, they're all holding palm branches, and she asks him, says, what are those for? She's kind of confused. Forgetting to tell her the context, her daddy said this. People held them over Jesus' head as he rode by on a colt. Now the little girl was a little sad at first and then kind of got a little frustrated, put her hands on her hips. She said, wouldn't you know it, the one Sunday I missed, Jesus actually shows up to church and offers everybody free pony rides. <laughs> so I say happy Palm Sunday to all of you. Let's stand in the honor of reading God's word. John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these people came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. For where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thunders. Another said an angel had spoken. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. 
Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered, We have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and to worship you this morning. Father, what wonderful worship this morning. Already celebrating our resurrected King, King Jesus. Father, help us to be mindful, not just this week, but every week. That's the reason we celebrate on Sunday morning. And yes, I say celebrate. We're not just here for lifeless worship and a halfway listening to the truth of your word. No, Father, we are here to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and through his great loss, we might have great gain through eternal life. So God, we ask that you would speak through me into the hearts of the people. You tell us in your word, it's your Holy Spirit who is our counselor and our teacher. Father, as we read the words of Jesus just a moment ago, I pray that you would draw all men unto yourself. Make our hearts in unison with yours. Give us a heart for the mission to which you've called us. Thank you, Father, for your greater love. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to look at our loss first. Our loss in verses 20 through 26. Let me say this to you about our loss. His greater love means losing our lives to him. His greater love means losing our lives to him. In a moment, he's going to talk about his loss. The first thing that he does is address our loss. Now, it's interesting to me that John's gospel did not have chapters and verses, but what is more interesting to me is the context with which chapter 12 verse 20 picks up. Jesus had just rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And remember they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And this made the Pharisees furious. So verse 19 tells us this. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that we are gaining nothing. Look the world has gone after him, and I have to think the Apostle John, as he is remembering this, he must have been close enough proximity to hear the murmuring, and he remembered back to what they said. The whole world has gone after him. Look at verse 20. Now among those who went up and worshipped at the feast were some Greeks. Quite literally, the whole world had come after Jesus. You see the humor in that? You're not laughing, but I was laughing in my office this week. The whole world had gone after Jesus. These Greeks here are Gentiles. We're not certain that they are necessarily Greeks or Romans, but this would be a common way of saying Gentiles. We're not exactly sure where they came from. Now, who, who are they? They are not Hellenistic Jews, right? These are not the Jewish people that took on the customs of the Greco-Roman world. No, it's not them. These are not full converts to Judaism. No, these are God-fears. These are people who had become disenchanted with the pantheon of gods and the godlessness that it led to in Greco-Roman society. These people are seeking out the one true God and guess what? They came to the right place, didn't they? And they were seeking the right person. Not everybody got it, but these Greeks did. The Jewish folks that were just proclaiming Jesus the Messiah did not get it, but these Greeks did. And so they came to Philip. Why would they come to Philip? Well, 
I'm not exactly sure. We got to read between lines. I'm not exactly sure how this all played out. It could well be that they're asking around and they, they rattle off, well, there's Jesus and here's some of his disciples that start rattling off names. Philip's name is a Greek name. It means lover of horses. I hope it doesn't mean that he loved to bet on the ponies, okay? <laughs> Philip grew up with Peter and his brother Andrew. He was a fisherman as well, but he had a Greek name. And so maybe they thought, well, this guy's got a Greek name. Maybe we should come to him. Quite possibly these Greeks could have been from the area called the Decapolis. That would be 10 Gentile cities around the area of uh, the Sea of Galilee. It says here that Philip was from Bethsaida. Maybe they had run into him in some business dealings or had seen him in a market. We're not exactly sure why they were drawn to Philip, but they come to Philip with this request. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. What a request. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. This is all in the temple area or in Jerusalem. They may have been walking around. Philip could not have been that far in proximity from Jesus, maybe from me to my family. Do you think that these Greeks were asking, hey, can you just point him out to us? We just want to look at him. You think that's what they're asking? They're asking for something more. What they are asking for is to be known by Jesus and for them to know him as well. They are asking for an audience with Jesus. It is not just enough to see Jesus, to look at a cross, to look at a dove, to look at whatever symbols that we have around here and to know about Jesus. They already knew about him. That's why they were there. That's why they were seeking him out. It is not enough to know about Jesus. No, they were asking. We want to experience him. Folks, this should lead to our call on our lives. Our role is Philip's role. Our role is to lead other people to Jesus. That is our role. That's what we're called to do. This is what he's called each of us to do individually, and, and it's what he's called all of us at Hyde Park to do collectively. He's called us to be the ones who bring other people to him. And remember, we are just his servants. He says he will draw all men unto himself. It is him who does it. We merely get to be a part of the process. We are merely the conduit with which he chooses to bring the gospel. And so they make the request in verse 22. Philip goes and asks Andrew, why in the world would Philip feel the need to go to Andrew? Philip must have been a little unsure. Or it could be that Andrew is Peter's brother and Peter's kind of a leader there, so maybe he was unsure. But, you know, if you go to passages like Matthew 15 and Mark 7, you'll remember the story of the Canaanite woman this Gentile who came, her daughter was demon-possessed, and she came and begged Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus responds to her, I have only come for the sheep of Israel. She begs him, and he says in response again, is it right to give the children's bread to dogs? And her response is even the dogs get to feed off of the crumbs of the children and through that statement of faith Jesus heals her daughter immediately the demon leaves her so maybe they're thinking back to that maybe Philip's thinking back to well you know Jesus said he really only came for us I don't I don't know if I should bother the the teacher the rabbi with this we're not sure exactly why or maybe Philip just wanted a buddy in case it was the wrong thing but he and Andrew go and they make the request to Jesus and it says that Jesus said to them I like to think that the Greeks were right alongside of them but in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to them, to Philip, to Andrew, to the Greeks, to all those who could hear, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is an interesting statement here. The hour has come. See, if we were to go back to the beginning of this gospel in John chapter 2, the wedding of Cana, the very first miracle that Jesus performs and allows his public ministry to begin. Remember, his protest to Mary is, my hour has not yet come. Yet she asks him, and so Jesus 
does what God has called him to do and he performs that miracle. In fact, Jesus' hour had not been come. It's the commentary that, that John mentions over and over in his gospel that the hour had not yet come. And now the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why? If they just merely want to meet him, these Gentile people, why would Jesus say, well, now all of a sudden my time has come? Well, he already addressed it in John chapter 10. The great chapter where Jesus is the good shepherd. Remember here what it says in verse 16 of John chapter 10. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Friends, we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight at 5 o'clock. I have my Jewish friend, Stuart Rothberg, coming. He is going to share the Seder service, what this Passover meal means, the foreshadowing of all that Jesus would do for us on Good Friday and his resurrection that would be coming on that Sunday. I'm really excited about it. But had Jesus not been here for all people, had he not had in mind to make us all one, my friend would not be here with us tonight because we're all Gentiles in here. I am grateful that Jesus, seeing that the, the whole world was coming after him as these Pharisees had pretty much prophesied about Jesus just moments before, came to fruition. Jesus realized that his hour finally had come that the son of man may be glorified how is he going to be glorified we'll see that in the verses to come jesus continues on in response to the request to meet him and he says truly truly i say to you anytime you see that in scripture when he says truly truly i father spirit and son are all in agreement unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies it remains alone but if it dies it bears much fruit what is jesus talking about kind of go into this like little mini parable this illustration that he has of a little grain of wheat if you've ever planted seeds in the ground what happens they go into the ground they're buried but if you water them and you give them sunlight what happens it shoots up tomato plants we've had those in our house before it shoots up it grows and what does it happen it bears fruit not just one tomato hopefully but dozens and dozens of tomatoes off of that tree jesus has a dual meaning i believe behind giving us this little illustration of the seed going and dying so that there can be life what does that sound like does that sound like the events that take place from friday to sunday amen is he a firstborn among the dead as the word of God tells us, Jesus is the firstborn among the dead. But he's talking also not about just his sacrificial death, but the demands of discipleship here. What does it cost us to follow Jesus? If we ourselves are that grain of wheat, we must die so that others can live as well. We must die not in the sense that Jesus did but we die to ourselves in our will because myself and my will is all about me I ain't worried about none of the rest of you we must die to ourselves so that we can live for Jesus and Jesus can live for us and through us and in us so that we might bear fruit you see this truth played out earlier in Jesus' ministry. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. There's that death of the seed so that others may have life. When he says take up your cross daily, it is not something uh, that we should take lightly. It would be thought insane in Jesus' day, any ladies in here have a cross around your neck, wearing it as jewelry? That was a picture of death, and we know that. But we celebrate that because your cross is empty, isn't it? Your cross is empty because, yes, Jesus died and he was buried, but that tomb was empty too, amen? 
take up your cross daily and follow after me. We must deny ourselves and follow after him. We must die to ourselves. It is our loss that leads to our gain as well. So he continues on in verse 25. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life for this world will keep it for eternal life. Now you see the word life in there in the English three times in verse 25. But there are two separate words that are used here. First is suke. It means soul. And it's used in the first two instances. The last instance is zoe. And it's used in, in connection with eternal, right? Uh, eternal life. So whoever wants, whoever loves his soul, should we love our soul? There's so much that is written today about loving ourselves first. You're going to hear a lot of TV preachers talking about, you got to love yourself. You got to love yourself. All the self-help books tell us we should love ourselves. Do you know who we are apart from Jesus Christ is unlovable? It really is. My Bible tells me all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If I'm left to my own devices, I'm an absolute jerk. So he says again, whoever loves his soul loses it. Is that true? The wages of sin is what? Death. As for you, you were dead in your sins and transgressions in which you used to live. You were dead men and women walking, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We will lose our soul if we love our soul too much. What's he talking about? He's talking about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. It is that seed that goes in the ground that, that dies to itself first so that we must much bear much fruit. So we must not love our own soul. If we do, we will lose it. But whoever hates his life in this world, his soul in this world, will keep it for eternal life. Now, is this self-hatred? Is this self-loathing that Jesus is talking about here? Absolutely not. It is not absolute contempt for ourselves. God so loved the world that he gave his only son right? Amen? So God loves us enough, but left to ourselves, we ought to hate our sinful self enough to allow that sinful self to die. And Jesus Christ to live in our hearts, for us in turn to live for him. So we see this again in Luke 9 verse 23 and then 24 and 25 whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for me will save it what good is it to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul the answer is it is no good it is no good there is nothing for us here on this earth yet to live for Jesus Christ when you look at your life Bible tells it is but a breath but a vapor stick your hand in front of your mouth we've done this before breathe out it's there and gone in just a moment isn't it Bible promises that we're not promised tomorrow we must live for Christ today it is not worth anything you could gain here on earth, wealth, fame, whatever it may be. It is not worth anything for you to lose your soul. We must live for Jesus. He continues in verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Anyone who serves me, the Father, Father will honor him. Jesus is telling us that his sheep, as he says in John 10, go where he goes. They know his voice. And they come when he calls them. Where does his voice lead? The great Philippian hymn. Jesus is humiliated first, and then he is exalted. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Where does Jesus want us to follow him, but to be that seed of wheat in the ground and die so that we might live and give, truly live and give life and bear fruit to others. That's what he's called us to do. Are you willing to follow Jesus? Amen. Are you willing to give your very life for him? I'm not just talking physically. 
are you willing to give over what you desire for him? That's a difficult question. You are not to live for you. As the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So I say to you about our loss, his greater love means losing our lives to him. Are you willing to do that? You willing to give him everything, control of everything? How about collectively here at Hyde Park? Are you willing to give Jesus full control over what goes on here? Are we trying to cling to things that we want? There's things, guys, this is the best part of my week right here. It is. Would I be a good pastor and would you want me here very long if this is all I did? We always joke pastor works one hour a week. Would I be the pastor God's called me to be if I didn't do the other work leading lay people, leading staff, leading the change that needs to happen so we can reach the people that we need to reach? Counseling, pastoring, caring, None of those things could happen if I wasn't willing to lose my life, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to you, to be the leader that he's called me to be. But it's the same for you. Don't hold the pastor on a pedestal. I'm a sinner just like you are. But I have the same calling that you have. Guess what? You're to give your very life for him. You're to give your all for him. You're to be about the things that he is about, not just about what you want to be about. So let's move from our loss to his loss. Let me say to you about his loss. His greater love requires losing his life, paying for our sin. His greater love required losing his life, paying for my sin and for your sin. Now Jesus echoes passages like Matthew 26, 39, when he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane here in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled, absolutely. He knows what's coming. He knows his hour has come. That hour means that he must give his very life. That is the loss that we're talking about here. His soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Oh, that it be so for you and for me. Would we as Hyde Park Baptist Church say it's not about me? Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name in me. Father, glorify your name in Hyde Park. Not the things that I want, but the things that he wants for you and for me. Father, glorify your name. And when he speaks these things in verse 28, the Father speaks for the third time in Jesus' ministry. He says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. These are kind of like bookends with a high point in the middle. He speaks in the synoptic gospels at Jesus' baptism. He gives his approval there. He gives his approval at the, the transfiguration. That's a turning point where Jesus turns his face and sets it like stone to Jerusalem. And he speaks here. Why does he do it? The crowd is confused, it says. Some think that it just thunders. Others think that it was an angel. Jesus gives us why this voice spoke, and it was not just thunder, Jesus says in verse 30. No, this voice comes for your sake, not mine do you believe that if God would speak in an audible voice for those people's sake and not for Jesus sake so this is the spoken word of God amen don't you believe then that our God is big enough that all of the written word of God Genesis 1 1 to Revelation twenty two twenty one, 21 that it is all for our sake not merely his own amen that's why we are told that all scripture is breathed out by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God allowed his voice to be heard so that people would know who Jesus is. Who is he? Verse 31. Now is the judgment of the world. He's the one that's coming in judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Who's going to do it? Who's going to do it and how's it going to happen? He tells us in verse 32 and 33, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. 
Jesus will do it. Jesus is the one who will cast Satan. Now, Jesus is the one who ultimately defeats him through his sacrificial death on his cross in his resurrection that Sunday morning. So it says here in verse 32, when I am lifted up. Now, the, the word there in the Greek is ek. It can be mean lifted up or out from. And I think there is a dual meaning here. Now, John tells us in verse 33, Jesus showed, said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. But I think it's a Friday and a Sunday meaning. Friday meaning, yes, he will be lifted up. He's talking about he's going to die on the cross. He's letting them know. He's speaking of his loss. He spoke about our loss, what it cost us to follow him. Now he's telling us about his loss. But his loss in being lifted up from the earth also leads to his great gain as well. Because three days later, on that Sunday morning, he was lifted ek, out from the earth as well. Amen? It is not just about his death. When we come back Sunday morning, we're not celebrating his death. We're celebrating his life. We're celebrating his life. And this is one thing that I will never get over. And trust me, I try to be very careful when we talk about people coming to Christ and salvations and baptisms is one thing I cannot let abide. And that is those who speak about people they brought to Christ. Their salvations, their baptisms. What does Jesus say in verse 32? And when I am lifted up from the earth, who draws all people to, to who? Is it us Drawing all people to us, Hyde Park. Should we be worried about growing Hyde Park or should we be worried about growing Christ's kingdom, amen? We're merely the conduit. It is not even us about us leading people to Jesus. Yes, he uses us, but Jesus says here unequivocally, I will draw all men unto myself. That is his role. It is his right. It is his privilege because he's the one that did the work. He's the one who suffered and died for your sin, my sin. As it's been said, we're just one beggar showing another beggar where they can find bread. There should be no arrogance in us. So his greater love required losing his life, paying for our sins Wages of sin is death. There's some great news, though. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. His loss means our gain, doesn't it? Think about that, folks. The great disparity of his death for our life. Our sin for his righteousness. Don't get me started on us that when we think we're righteous, we're not. We're standing here naked in our sin and Jesus comes and he clothes us in his righteousness. It's still his robe with which he clothes me. It's never mine. I'm just using it. By the way, anything we own, we're merely stewards. The earth is Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who dwell in it, everything we have, including Christ's righteousness, it's his, not ours. It's his, not ours. So we move from his loss to the light, and I'll say to you, his greater love allows you to become children of light. His greater love allows you to become children of light. The people are a bit confused when he says that he's going to be lifted up. They figured he might have meant his death, and so the people in general are questioning him. They said, we've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. What are they talking about? It's never mentioned in the Torah or in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. No, they're meaning the whole of the Old Testament, and it is mentioned there that the Messiah would reign forever. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, and then verse 16, God is making promises to David, but he's making promises not about David or about Solomon or somebody that else that physically came through the line or just the line in general. No, he uses singular here when he says he, and he's talking about Jesus. He says, when your days are over and you, you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up from your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his singular kingdom. He, singular, Jesus is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of Jesus' kingdom forever. That's what he's talking about there. Amen? Amen. Your house, your kingdom, David, 
will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. But it was through Jesus. Jesus' throne would be established forever, not the way that people saw it. They got the wrong Messiah. They didn't realize that Jesus would come in meekness, that he would come as a suffering servant, that he would come to be that ultimate sacrifice. No, they didn't get it. So they said, who is the son of man? And Jesus, in answering their question, doesn't answer their question maybe the way that they would want it, but he answers it the way that the true Messiah came. He says this, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. Folks, there are so many people. We want to hold everybody accountable out in the world for all the sin that they're committing. We want to say shame on them. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. They're groping in the darkness. We're to point them to the light. Jesus said already in John in chapter 8, then in chapter 9, he says, I am the light of the world. If these people had picked up on it, Jesus is speaking of himself. He's saying, I'll only be with you a little while longer. And that would be true because physically he would die five days later on that cross. His light physically would only be with them for a little while. But here's the scary thing, folks. Do you know what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 14? Even though that light is physically gone, he said, you yourselves are the light of the world. Scary to me because I know who I am in my own. I hate my own soul left to its own devices because I know it leads to eternal life, amen? Are you to that point? Are you to that point where you say, it doesn't matter about me, it matters about Jesus? I'm gonna give my life to him it is scary because he is living in and through us. Do people see Jesus in you? Do people see Jesus in you? I'm going to hit myself here in the way you drive. <laughs> right? How about the way you conduct yourself in the office with your kids at home, your spouse, your in-laws, neighbors, friends? That light would be there only for a little while, but that light continues on through you and me. And he finishes in verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. There it is, folks. Believe in Jesus. Believe in him. Jesus is the light. He is the light if we merely believe in him. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, what, believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life yes he is that life he's giving that invitation to believe in him and that believe is a continuance of believing it is not just once it is always believing in him his greater love allows you to become children of light are you a child of light and if you are a child of light are you letting that light shine as Jesus gets into in the sermon on the mount like a city on a hill are you shining in the darkness so that others can see Jesus in you. Jesus again said, I'll draw them into myself. You gotta be ready to receive them. Finally, this is what you need to understand from all of this today. His greater love brought loss to him, but eternal life to you. His greater love brought eternal life to you. His greater love brought loss to him, but eternal life to you. Are you grateful for his loss that would be your gain are you grateful for his greater love? And if you are, then you've already lost yourself. And you're living for him. In a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. In that invitation, I want to give you an opportunity to come just like last week and every week. If you need to get right with Jesus, you can do it right where you are, but this is always open for you. Several other pastors and myself will be here down front. If you need prayer, we want to pray with you. And if you need prayer and you're watching online, you can text us to 512-812-9750. And if you want to receive Jesus, just text the word Jesus to that same number, 512-812-9750. And if you need Jesus and you're in this room, don't walk, run. Run. Let me pray with you. Let us rejoice with you that you are ready to believe in him, to receive 
he who is the light. Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for allowing us to be in your presence today. God, we pray. We pray that we would see your great loss and make that eternal life-changing decision that we're ready to lose ourselves so that we might gain you, the life that you've promised to give us, the light that you've promised to give us for all of eternity. Bless this time of invitation, Lord, in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I stand for the broken, for the weary, for the helpless, so in need, for the outcast, for the guilty, come and lay down presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. There is freedom. We're forgiven. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let me just share with you all, just you be seated for just a moment. Do not forget today, 5 o'clock in the chapel, we're going to have a special Seder service. I promise you, Stuart is amazing. You're going to enjoy it. Please come back. We would love to have you here this afternoon at 5 o'clock, and then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper as uh, we have in the past on Palm Sunday evening uh, together, and I'm really excited about that. Also, please don't forget, I want every one of these invitation cards gone today. Grab as many as you can. When you go out to lunch today, you see a young family, invite them to the egg hunt, which is out at our quarries next Saturday morning at 9 30 and then please 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 i pray that you will consider coming and bringing someone with you next sunday morning at either 9 30 and 11 i pray that you've had these opportunities all these weeks to either serve in one and intend in one i pray that if you are willing to come uh, that you would consider coming and serving and attending and also i need some of you not all of you because it'll be really weird if it's super full at 9 30 and nobody's here at 11 but it'll be equally as awkward if nobody hears it at 9.30 and everybody brings their friends at 11. So you pray about it. I'm praying that God's going to work it all out. But I pray that we have two great crowds next Sunday at 9.30 and 11. Let me leave you with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord make his face turn towards you. And give you peace. Go and give his greater love to someone else this week. Y'all have a great week. As we come to the close of our service today, I pray you have sensed God's love for you. In addition, I hope you know that we care about you and we would be honored to pray for you and talk with you about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He truly does love you and cares about you and your journey in life. So once again, you can text PRAYER to 512-812-9750 9750 for prayer or if you'd like more information about who Jesus is and how to begin a relationship with him you can text Jesus to that same number that's 512-812-9750 I hope you have a great week and we're looking forward to seeing you again next week either in person or online <laughs>